Hello and welcome back to OC Avery and welcome to episode 4 of the Natives in Norwich Zoom Room. This week we are joined by David Henderson and we talk about a lot of different medications and different supplements to give the birds to better their health and how we can tell differences between different diseases um, such as the respiratory diseases that we get in birds there's several different ones and the medications to use for them there's plenty of information to take in this video so it, i would recommend that you get a notepad and you take notes as you go through the video because there's plenty of different tips that you're going to want to um, write down and actually use in your own bird room to promote the best health in your birds and have more success in the breeding season so i hope you do enjoy this episode so sit back relax and enjoy hello and welcome back to the natives of norwich zoom room this is episode five with dave henderson so thank you for joining us dave um please would you introduce yourself and tell us a quick overview of the bird you keep um yeah my name is david dave henderson um i've been in i've been keeping british finches actually since late 1970s early early 80s i haven't actually got any birds at the moment because um i had to give them up um about i don't know maybe eight or ten years ago um the, the work i do uh, you know i work for a big company and, and i look after a lot of pharmacies and um my work takes me sort of all over the country all over the country um and it got to the stage actually just you know i'd had two successive bad breeding seasons just because i wasn't there actually during the breeding season yeah. and i just got a bit hacked off with it and um not being able to be there for the birds as often as I should because I was travelling so much. I was going up north and all over the country, up and down to London, up and down to um, Nottingham regularly. I mean weekly. Um, so I, yeah. can, I, I packed them in, but you know I've, I've still kept my hand in. I still really enjoy the bird game and being involved in it and meeting all the guys and stuff. Still went to a number of shows and continued ju judging as well, which I really enjoy doing. You know. Yeah, no, that's fair enough. I guess it's a, a quite time consuming, especially during the breeding season. So you can't always, um, yeah, if you can't be. Well, there, the, it's the, the thing, thing that made it difficult as well is like one of the problems I've got is where I live. There's not a lot of birdmen around where I live, um, and I had an old guy that lived not that far from me. He used to look after birds when I was on the holiday, because I always go abroad. My wife and family always want to go to America, and so we go every year. Yeah. Or at least we were before COVID nineteen hit, and um, the guy that was looking after my birds really he wasn't keeping too well he was an old guy and he just he wasn't fit to do it actually so again that was another problem for me it's just actually getting somebody to step in and look after the birds when i wasn't there yeah it was an additional problem so okay, yeah that's, tricky. that's absolutely fair enough um so how did you get started what age and did any family keep birds before you um my father and grandfather kept pigeons all their life i mean my dad passed away a couple of years ago at 80 years old and he had pigeons since he was eight so he had them for 72 years my grandfather had them as well um, with them, they, they used to raise pigeons in partnership. So, uh, my, me and my four brothers were kind of brought up around pigeons. I was never really that interested in pigeons. My dad always wanted me to go into them, but it just didn't float my boat. Um, but also, as a sideline to the pigeons, I mean, my grandfather, when I, when I was seven years old, the first time he ever did it, he took me to the Scottish National Bird Show, and of course, that just lit my eyes up with all the different birds there, and all the soft bills, and you know, all, you know, it's big, big classes of birds back in these days at the Corn Exchange. In Edinburgh, and that just kind of made me really interested. And then what happened was, my older brother was two years older than me. He he um, started collecting birds' eggs, and that just I got involved in that as well, not on a big scale, but um, it, it just really stimulated that sort of wanting to be close to birds and stuff like that. And then I went from there, probably mid teens. Um, a really good friend of mine's got lurcher dogs, and I ended up getting them as well. And we used to go out with the lurchers all the time. And through the lurchers, I met a guy. Um, George Pretzel, who kept a few natives in a in a navery, and he was breeding mules and stuff, you know, goldfinch mules and stuff. And when I saw them, that was it. I just had to have some. And then he introduced me to a guy called Alec Baxter, one of the greats in the Scottish bird, Scottish British bird fancy. Um, Alex, you know, a lot of the old guys will know Alex or remember him. He's long dead now, but he was a phenomenal bird man, actually. Um, famous goldfinch that he had that won everywhere all, all over the UK for a good few years, actually. And Alec gave me my first birds. Oh, a pair of bullfinches, a pair of siskins and a pair of red bulls is what I started off with and then just kind of went from there yeah, yeah no that that is um, that's excellent, a different way than a lot of other people, especially going straight in with the native birds, obviously you had the experience with the pigeons as well yeah. um, so actually we'll start going into the medication side, so how did you become interested in drugs and medication for birds 
Well, I mean, I, I'm a pharmacist. You know, that's my, my profession. I did a degree in, in pharmacy, a four-year degree at Heritage University back in 81 to 85. So that coincided with me really starting to get a bit serious about keeping native birds, see? And of course, um, the, the course that I did, there was a bit of microbiology and, you know, a bit of genetics in it and all that sort of stuff. And I got interest in all that. And it just, um, I quickly sort of developed this thought process around understanding drugs and medicines and how they could be applied to birds and started sort of, you know, sort of, you know, trial and error type thing in, in, in many cases. But I'm the type of guy who reads everything. When I get into a subject, I read every single book or whatever I can get my hands on. And, and I've, I've, I've done that all my life, actually, and continue to do that with, with learning medicines. So, um, you know, you know, I was involved in, close to a lot of bird men as well, and they were all using drugs for their birds and various different things. Yeah. A lot of old, old wives' tales as well. And of course, being involved in close to the pigeon fancy, it's a huge, um, uh, you know, lots and lots of pigeon guys are involved with medications and trying to treat things and make the birds go better and all that sort of stuff. So yeah. that's kind of how I got involved in it, you know. Oh, fantastic. Um, so obviously with the, for the remainder of this call, we're going to talk a lot about the medication side of it uh, with you being very knowledgeable yeah. in the area. Um, so to start off with, what would you recommend to treat birds uh, with before the breeding season? And before the breeding season... Um, I know there was one of the guys on the site that I noticed that they posted that question as well. There's two things in the breeding season. You know, one of the things is the preparation of the the, the aviaries and, and the you know the house the, the house where the birds will be kept because lots and lots of different diseases. In fact, many of them, um, the birds will be passing disease into the environment of the aviary. So you have to be really spotless and clean the aviary, um, deep clean it almost, and, and the cages wherever you're, you're keeping your birds and breed them. So that's a really really important part of it. So we'll talk later on about coccidiosis and atoxoplasmosis and golden light greenfinches. One of the big problems is those those um, internal parasites pass eggs, oocysts, and they disperse themselves all over the aviaries. Um, and and they can live for years actually in the aviary environment. Same with worms, eggs as well. So you've got to really clean the aviaries out. And I used to, every single year, treat the inside of my aviaries with crozote because crozote was very, very caustic. It contains chemicals called phenols in the burn, actually. Um, so I used to use, I used to try and coat the insides of the aviary with crozote every year because it kind of sterilizes the aviaries. And then what I also used to do was um, I'd, I'd use a blowtorch, um, the tip of a blowtorch to go over all the hard surfaces with that. That would yeah. kill anything that was there, actually. So so that's one part of it, I think. As far as treating birds are concerned, in terms of before the, the, the breeding season, I'd probably say, you know, We've got this big issue with, with, with the native birds, you know, the, the, the atoxoplasmosis, the, go, the golden light, particularly prevalent in green finches, but affects most species of finches. Um, and it's not a bad idea to treat the birds a month or two, the adult birds, for the for that disease, actually, because what I'll yeah. do is I'll re reduce the, the oocyst count, actually. When, when you when you give the drugs, the, the, the birds the medication, it, it almost puts the, the parasite into remission almost. It makes it, you know, it hides, if you like, within the body tissues, yeah. and they stop they stop reproducing and producing the, the oocysts. So that's really really important. So I would, and, and I mean baycocks. We could speak again in a, a, bit, a bit more detail about baycocks, but you know, in all the years I kept green, I used to specialise in green finches for a number of years, uh, and we used to use this, the so-called so sulfur drugs, the sulfur yeah. amide antibiotics, and you'd use them as a prophylactic during the breeding season, you know, to prevent the, the the youngsters getting getting the disease. But they weren't really, you know, the the, the, the the sulfur drugs weren't that brilliant for cleaning a bird out, if you like, yeah. Baycox is much, much better than that. So, you know, it's a good idea to treat the birds. Give the, the, the birds a two-day a two dose of Baycox about maybe a month before you pair them up. So that'd be one thing. Right, okay. I guess the second thing would be wormers. So I used to always worm my birds. And if I'm really honest, in all the years I kept birds, and you're talking 30-odd 30, 30 years I was breeding them, I never saw any any sign of worms in my birds, but I used to always worm them twice a year. And I used a drug called levomycil for that, actually. Very, very effective for for taking worms out of birds. And most small birds, like, you know, finches, it'll be, if they get any worms at all, it'll be hair worm or round worm they'll have. And levomycil yeah. was very, very good for that. So again, I treat them once or twice a year, around about February time, and again, around about September, October, once the breeding season is over, I'd, I'd worm them twice a year. So they would be the two sort of main things I would do. And I wouldn't use any other drugs really other than those two. You know, the, you know, the worming agent and the anticoxidial. Um, I'd give the birds vitamins for sure. And it's a good idea because when you're feeding the birds during the winter, mainly in a hard seed diet, lots of hard seed, most hard seed in fact, is 
it's not got a great vitamin content and it's particularly um, short of vitamin A. So you really want to give a multivitamin preparation for them, you know, prior to the breeding season. Yeah. Um, oh, well, I would give. I used to give my birds vit- vitamins every single week, actually, right through the whole season. But I'd up that a little bit more, and and in the lead up to the breeding season, and give them it daily. Actually, is what I would do. Right. Yeah. That's that's excellent. Thank you very much. Um, there's probably you know, just before you go in. There's probably yeah. one other thing worth mentioning, and I've seen another quite a lot about it in, in forums and stuff, and that's the use of calcium. Um, and and when you should give calcium, or when you shouldn't give calcium. So the cru- the crucial time for giving calcium to birds is, as as you know, in, in the lead up to hens laying eggs. Yeah. Um, and that would be the only time of the year that I'd specifically give my birds calcium supplements, and I'd always give them a cal- calcium supplement just when they go for the first round, actually. And the reason I would do that is, you know, egg eggshells are made of calcium, calcium phosphate, um, and a bird, the hen bird, has got more than enough calcium in its skeleton to mobilize that and produce, to push up its, its blood um, concentration of calcium. So there's a, there'd be plenty of calcium there, if you like, for it to lay the eggs and pass the eggs. Yeah. Now calcium, the, 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 managing the blood, the, the level of calcium, the, the concentration of uh, calcium in the blood, is, mani- is managed in the, body, in the bird's body by three or four different hormones. And the problem with calcium isn't so much the laying of the eggs, what I used to find with the birds, particularly, particularly when you go, go down for the first um, you know the, the 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 first round of the year. What a lot of people don't realise is that muscular contraction sucks up calcium. It requires calcium for muscles to contract. Yes. It requires calcium to do that. So when I, when a hen's passed an egg, not only does she does she, does she need calcium enough calcium in her bloodstream to pass the egg, but she needs enough calcium in the bloodstream to actually function the muscles and make the muscles contract as well. So what you find in the breeding season is, particularly the early part of the breeding season. Hens will sometimes go egg bound, and I think yes. the egg bind, the egg binding is caused by the fact the hen probably hasn't mobilised enough calcium in its bloodstream. Its its hormonal system's not kicked in sufficiently early in the season, and therefore the combination of of need the calcium for the egg and to produce a strong muscular contraction to expel the egg sometimes there's not enough there actually, and then the hen can't pass the egg. So that's in my view what causes egg binding. Yeah, that, now, now that to, makes complete sense. I used to always, always give the hens, and when, once I went to nest and, and was sitting in the nest and started to lay, before they started to lay the eggs, three or four days before it, I'd, I'd, I'd use a, a calcium supplement and a drinking water and give it to them. And I never had problems uh, you know, with egg binding because of that. Now, th- that the, is, the calcium, yeah, that's great. Um, the calcium supplement, you've got to be careful which one you use because a lot of them are absolutely not, not worth buying. They're rubbish. Yeah. Um, Calcium's what would available. you recommend with it? Well, the one I used to always use was Calcivet, made by the Bird Care Company. Right. And the reason I used that one is way back, way back in the day, all the forms of calcium that were available were like calcium lactate, calcium carbonate. They're basically insoluble powders. So calcium's available as a salt, you know, calcium, yeah. um, calcium lactate, calcium phosphate. They're, they're all different salts of calcium. Calcium's a metal, actually, and it doesn't exist in its own, its own form. It always binds to something else and creates a salt. The trouble is a lot of the salts are completely insoluble in water. So if you take calcium carbonate, for example, as a powder, excuse me, <clears throat> take calcium carbonate and you mix it with water, what will happen after a short while is the, un- the, the, the solid calcium granules will just sink to the bottom of the water. They, just, they don't dissolve and they don't mix either on suspension. They just sink down. So that's not a good way of doing it. But, you know, yeah. chemists being smart as they are, started producing calcium in a form, in a liquid form, that it would dissolve completely in water and therefore when you put it in the water the birds drink it they took it in no problem at all so if yeah. you're buying if you're using calcium be very very careful and steer away from if you look in a packet or a bottle and it tells you it's calcium lactate or it's calcium phosphate or it's calcium carbonate i wouldn't touch it because they're no good they're just solid powders actually and they're not well absorbed so you want it in liquid for them fantastic no that is that that's fantastic great advice thank you very much uh, for sharing that so um as we continue with just with vitamins how would you recommend um sort of administering them would you put them in the water or egg food for example um i used to always put mines in the water always um a lot of egg foods are formulated with vitamins in them they've got added added, added stuff in them see but i always used to put it in the water because i'd use it year round i just got a soluble vitamin powder and just dissolve it in the water and you guarantee the birds are getting it that way. I think when you put it in egg food, 
you're never quite sure if they're getting enough of it actually and unless you only put <coughs> only put enough egg food in that they eat the whole lot before you put any more in yeah but the thing with vitamins is i think one of the questions on the forum was um you know are, are some brands of vitamins better than others the thing with vitamins is what you really want is a is a, is a, a vitamin and mineral mixture and you want one without amino acids in it ideally and the reason for so a lot of it you, you know you basically get vitamins minerals amino acids and the problem with amino acids is to stink really badly and make the water foul they make it taste foul actually it stinks like rotten cabbages there's yeah. two particular amino acids lysine and methionine and when you when they're added to a vitamin mixture and that's put in water it makes the water rancid smell really badly so if i'm so what my recommendation would be is you know ideally you want to get a powder vitamin um, there is only vitamins and minerals with no amino acids added. Amino acids, birds need it, but you want to put that in egg food. And egg yeah. food will have it in it anyway. It's, it's proteins, it's because of proteins. Yeah, so, it's, so obviously it's with the uh, proteins breaking down, isn't it, With the, to get the amino acids? Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's that way around. Um, yeah. So actually, is there any particular vitamin supplement you'd recommend? Not uh, really. I, I think they're all one's as good as another. There's none. There's none on the market that would stand out any better than any any other ones. Um, I, I would just buy buy anyone. Again, I used to, back in the day, I used to use the Bird Care Company's products because some of the products were very good. Some of them, they made outrageous claims about what the, the products could do, but their vitamin um, powders were really good and the calcium vitamin was really good as well. So I used to use them all the time, but there's lots of other ones, Aviform and all these different ones. Just make sure that if you're adding vitamins to the water, you haven't got any amino acids in it because it'll just make it full. Yeah, no, that that's great um, advice for that. Um, so actually, just with uh, on vitamins again, would you like what? What do you think about synthetic versus natural vitamins? Um, I, I think I think most vitamins that are available these days are synthetic. The majority of them, because they're easy to make, they're very easy to manufacture in a lab, and they're as good as you know, they're as good as um, natural ones. Um, it's great if you can get natural ones. The question is, where are you going to get the natural ones? And the only tricky, I think, with natural ones is you're never quite sure how much vitamin's in there because vitamins are broken down by sunlight and stuff like that, you know? Um, yeah. And therefore, you know, if, for example, if you want to give a birds of vitamin C, you can either buy it in powder form of ascorbic acid vitamin C, or you can give them berries or, or raspberries or something, something like that. And there's lots of vitamin C in that and rose hips as well. So there's lots of stuff you can buy, you can get naturally out in the fields that you can give to the birds that are high in vitamins, but you're never quite sure how much, what the vitamin content's in them. Because when you yeah. use a synthetic one, you're guaranteed. You know exactly how much you're adding and uh, how much the birds are getting. Again, in the water, mostly, or you can put, put in egg food if you want. Yeah. So they're both good. Yeah. They're both good. I just think the synthetic ones are the way I'd go, because you're guaranteed that you know you're getting exactly what you're getting. Yeah, because it, it does the um, same job, like you're saying. It, it's knowing the concentration of that as well. Um, just uh, on on with that, um, uh, the use of probiotics beneficial. Um, this question which which was brought up um, on the forum. Um, this is a personal opinion. Yeah, it means. Yeah, I, I wouldn't give pro probiotics to birds at all, and I wouldn't I wouldn't take them myself either. So probiotics are becoming quite common for humans. I mean, they mix them and you get them in yogurts and all sorts of stuff now, don't you? And yeah. you can buy pro probiotics. I just don't believe in them actually. I don't know. I don't know what they do. I mean, there's this theory that you know they're friendly bacteria, so you take them orally and you swallow them, and they fill your guts with friendly bacteria, so-called friendly bacteria. But I just, I just don't. I don't buy it. I think it's a money-making racket. If I'm really honest with you, I don't. I don't see any benefit from it. I've only once in my life ever tried a probiotic myself, and they gave me the worst sore stomach I've ever had in my life. But it lasted about a week. It just completely upset my insides. And I thought to myself, it's doing that to me. Can't be very good for birds either, you know. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a believer in probiotics. I just, I, I think I'd, I wouldn't bother. I wouldn't give them to birds personally. No, fair enough. Um, so, so on just with the antibiotics. Um, so after you treat your birds with antibiotics, if if you do, what would you recommend to give them to build them back up on that? So, so here's another myth. Yeah, and the the myth is. That when you take an antibiotic, you should get vitamins or something like that to build you back up. Yeah, that's not true. Yeah, so the major the majority we, we could speak in detail about some drugs if you like, and we can get into some of that and we'll talk about some of the conditions. Um, there are very very few antibiotics that I can think of that actually deplete your system. 
So if so, we give you an example, the penicillins, we don't often give um, penicillins to, to birds, but we do in human medicine quite a lot. There's no, when you take a penicillin, there's absolutely no need to take any vitamins af or, or, or after it. And the reason for that is the way that penicillins work. Um, bacterial cells have a, uh, if you think, imagine a bacterial cell being like a, a tiny, tiny little balloon that's got, a, you know, that's a, that's a cell membrane. Yes. But bacteria have a cell wall around them as well. So they've got an outer coating, which in, in human cells, animal cells, and, um, mammalian cells, um, bird cells, we, we don't have that. We just we just have a cell membrane. We don't have that outer coating. Penicillins act by by stopping the synthesis of that outer coating. So if you think about it, if that's what they're doing for bacteria, they're not affecting us in that way because we don't have a cell wall. See, so there's absolutely no point. You don't need to give an antibiotic after it. Um, the sulfonamide antibiotics, the sulfur drugs that we used for years and years with greenfinches. Now, if I'm really honest with you, I used to use them right through the pregnancy season to stop young birds going light. Um, and I used to always, I used, I used to give them five days on and two days off. And the two days that were off the drug, I used to give vitamins, but it's not really necessary because the way that these drugs work, the sulfonamide antibiotics, and, and they put, so, so going light is atoxoplasmosis, which is what the disease of going light is. It's a protozoa. And protozoa are like bacteria, but they're much more complex. They've got much more complex life cycles, yeah? yeah. Um, when the protozoa are multiplying, when they're, when they're you know, in, increasing in numbers, um, they synthesize a vitamin called folic acid. And, it, and it's, it's used for protein, it's used for the syn synthesizing the cell. Now, birds and humans, we, we don't synthesize our own folic acid. We, we get ours in our diet. So if you think about giving a bird a, a sulfonamide antibiotic, a sulfur drug, you're affecting the protozoa, but you're not affecting the bird in any way at all. So there's no need to give a, to give a you know, a vitamin or anything else to build the bird back after. And I'd say that's probably true, a 90 to 95% of the, the common things we use for birds to treat diseases and stuff. Now, I haven't said that, I haven't said that. I think it's really good practice to give, to give vitamins to birds, like for the reasons I said before, because quite often the diet we give them, particularly hard seed diet, is, is often deficient in, in vitamins and therefore it's a good idea to give vitamin preparations. But as far as drugs are concerned, treatment after drugs, it's not really necessary. No, no, that, uh, that that I think you make an excellent point with that. Um, yeah, th absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's obviously quite heavy stuff with some of that as well. Um, yeah, I, I study A level biology, and I'm a bit like <laughs> losing it on some of that. <laughs> um, so I, I understand some of the things and understand the structures, but damn. <laughs> um, so. Um, Storing medication, uh, both for factory sealed and open, would you recommend storing like Batril and Baycox in a fridge after being opened? Um, I, th I think what your what your recommendation with any drug, yeah, would be to follow the manufacturer's instructions. So if the box says keep it at room temperature, then keep it at room temperature. You'd only store something in the fridge if it says keep it at five degrees. Yeah. Uh, your fridge temperature has been, been typically between four and eight degrees as the temperature of a fridge. And you just you generally don't want to put most medicines into a fridge. It's not necessary, unless it specifically says put it in, you know keep it between five and eight degrees. Yeah. If it says keep it at room temperature, or sometimes it says twenty five degrees, keep it at twenty five degrees. Then what you want to do is put it in a, in a cupboard, a dark cupboard, because what happens with lots of drugs, light, sunlight, or artificial light, coupled with moisture, will break the drug down as a, as a chemical process called hydrolysis, which I'm sure you're aware of yes. <laughs> your chemistry studies. So hydrolysis splits drugs, it splits molecules actually. And it's caused by the sunlight as a, you know, it needs energy to create that reaction and sunlight or, or light produces that energy. So you always, always want to keep drugs or any medications in a dark cupboard away from light at room temperature for 95% of them. They'll, they'll only be the odd ones you have to keep in a fridge. I'll tell you a little story about a fridge, uh, keeping things in a fridge. Um, Years ago, when I was really big into the greenfinches, I was in partnership with Jim Rankin. A lot of the guys will know Jim. Jim's a fantastic breeder of the birds. But I used to get the medication that we needed because I had access to it, obviously. And at the time, we were using a, a sulfonamide antibiotic for the going light, you know, stop the going light in the young greenfinches, a drug called sulfur, um, sulfodimidine. The sulfodimidine was available in, in an injection. So I used to get big 500, 100 mil bottles, half litre bottles injection. Yeah. You, wouldn't, you wouldn't inject in the buzz, but you'd put a syringe in and draw it out and put it in the buzz drinking water and drop it into the drinking water by drops. And I remember one time I'd, I'd got a bottle of it and 
you know, I'd left it up, you know, I had a bottle at my place, a bottle up at Jim's place as well. And I went up one Sunday and Jim says, oh, I threw out, I threw out that, that, that bottle of medication. I said, what did you do that for? He says, well, it went, it went all um, furry. And what had happened was it was just, it had been a cold night. It was like two, two or three degrees outside. And when he went to get the bottle of stuff, he, he looked at it and it looked all furry inside. All it was, it was just it crystallised and started to freeze because it's got quite a high freezing point. You know, water um, freezes yeah. at zero degrees. That drug would freeze at about five or six degrees. And he'd left it in the shed overnight and it'd been a, bit, a little bit cold and frosty. And the thing had started to crystallise. That's all it was. The drug was perfectly right. okay. If he if heated it back up again and put it at room temperature, the crystals would have gone away. It had gone back into solution again. But he thought it was off, so he, <laughs> he threw it out. You know? right so there is, a, there is a risk in putting things in a fridge when you don't have to do it. Yeah. Um... That 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 that, is, that really answers a lot of questions. Um, we had quite a few people that had brought that up actually with storage. Um, so an example of one of the sulfur dr drugs we use for young birds is baycocks, uh, and obviously with older birds as well, which stops them or prevents them going from uh, from going light. Uh, it's recommended to use. Is it recommended to use one med, or should we be using like alternative uh, sulfur meds, or is there anything else that you would recommend as a sulfur med? I, I, I guess. I guess first of all, bay baycocks is not a sulfur drug. Yeah. And, yeah, and let's just talk about this first of all because it's quite interesting. Over the years, some of the things I've heard people saying. So, I've I've heard people. I've seen it on forums before. People talking about using sulfur, sulfur, to treat going light. So sulfur is an element. It's a it's a yellow smelly powder that smells like rotten eggs. It has no connection whatsoever to the sulfur drugs. Yeah, well, the only connection it has is that um, these and the, the antibiotics, the group of antibiotics we used for years were called sulfur drugs. But the correct terminology is sulfonamide antibiotics. There's a chemical group called the sulfonamide group that all these all these molecules had attached to them, yeah? Um, and there was lots of different ones actually at the time. Baycox is not a sulfonamide antibiotic. It's a completely different group of drugs. It belongs to a group of drugs called the tri trizines. Um, and there's, again, there's a number of them available as well. Um, so I guess that's the first thing. So lots of people over the years have asked about sulfur drugs and it's confused about what a sulfur drug actually is. Is it sulfur is it sulfur or what? Well it's got it's got sulfur as part of its chemical structure, but it's not salt it's not sulfur. They should really be they should really call them sulf sulfonamide antibiotics because that's a correct name. So what was the part of the, what was the second part of the question there again? Um so is it recommended to use one med or should we use um alternative types? Uh and, and anything else that you'd recommend as a sulfur med actually to to prevent them going light almost. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, obviously, everybody's using Baycox these days. That's that's the drug, and it's a it's a fantastic drug. You know, you know, the sulfonamide antibiotics, like I said earlier on, work in one specific way, and that is that they stop the protozoa cell and um, producing folic acid. Whereas Baycox works at several different parts of the the parasites. It's like a parasite, actually, protozoa. That it works in several different parts of the life cycle, so it's really, really effective. Now, I know that um, Baycox is used in lots of animals. In fact, it was used in animals long before, farm animals long before it was ever used for birds. So pigs, sheep, cattle, all different things. And I also know that there's there's lots of examples now of the, the protozoa that is used to treat the animals becoming resistant. So particularly in pigs, yes. becoming an issue. And, and it was used for years and years in, in pig production. Um, young piglets now the, the, the disease has become resistant so there's always a risk that when you use drugs over a period of time resistance will develop and it, it is a good idea to circulate different drugs rather than using the same one all the time now you know the question is there's only a limited number of drugs that will be effective against these protozoa these coccidiosis and atoxoplasmosis so in a perfect world what you'd probably do is find three or four different sulfonamide antibiotics and also use Baycox and do them in circulation. So maybe you use Baycox one year, use sulfodimidine the next year, use ESB3 actually, which is a common sulfonamide drug for years and years. You might use that one as well. But people tend to stick with Baycox because it's really effective and it works really well. And you don't have to give the birds it often, as often yeah. as you would with the sulfonamides. Yeah. But there is a risk by keeping using Baycox the protozoa might become resistant to it as, as, as a big risk. Yeah, that's just with the mutations, isn't it? And actually, the actually building, oh, well, either building up the resistance, um, but it's usually genetic mutations, I think, isn't it? Um, yeah. yeah. When, they, when they build up this resistance. Um, uh, j just on uh, Baycox, actually, uh, 
what would you say the pros and cons of Baycox are? Uh, we had this asked uh, a few days ago about that. Well, I, I guess I guess the, the the main pro, if you like, is that Baycox is a really really effective drug. It does the job, <laughs> yeah. and you only need to use it for a couple of days at a time. You know, when we use the sulfonamides, we use all the sulfur drugs. It'd be five days on, two days off, right through the whole breeding season. I mean, when I was using sulfonamides, and most people would do the same thing. You'd use, I, I put them on at the day the, the day the chicks came out of the nest. So as soon as the, the chicks popped the nest, that was a drug going in, 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 into the water. Five days on, two days off. And start then, and I'd take it off them once they'd finished molting. So that's quite a period. In two or three months, they'd be on a drug. Bakehouse is much more effective, so you only have to get, put them on it for two days at a time. And probably two days a month is more than sufficient. More than sufficient. Yeah. And, and Baycox has very few side effects as well. So it's, it's, it's quite a safe drug in that respect, you know. Um, so that would be its pros. I think um, it, its cons, I, I don't really think it's got many cons apart from the risk of um, them becoming resistant to it. But there's no real signs of that yet in, in, in finches that the, the protozoa become resistant. There's, we haven't seen that yet. So yeah. I don't really see it as being a problem. So Baycox no, is a... That, that, terrific drug and I, I, I keep recommending people use it yeah that, that, it has it does it, it has a couple of side effects i mean one of them would be gastric upset so the only real side effect you'll see in bacox and this is true of farm animals as well that sometimes you get a tummy upset or slight diarrhea with it so if you see that happening with the, well it's very hard to tell how can you how can you tell a bird's got an, a small bird's got an upset stomach you, you can't it's virtually impossible they start to have loose droppings and watery droppings, that might be a bit of a, uh, a signal that says actually this is starting to cause a bit of a problem and they tease it off a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so what what would you say your top essential bird room supplements and medications are? Um, what do they do in the dosage? Um, the, the, the top ones. So I guess, um, what would I say? So you want, you're, you definitely have to have Baycocks. Or if you weren't, use, if weren't using Bacox, you want a good sulfonamide antibiotic, yeah? And you'd use them purely for the going light, yeah? So that's when I say going light, I'm talking about young birds. Going light is not a disease, it's a symptom of a disease. Going light is when the birds lose weight, you know, their, their, their keel bone sticks out, the yeah. muscles, the, the pectoral muscles just get emaciated, the bird sits humped up, looks really sick, won't eat, won't drink, dies usually quite quickly, yeah? That's what going, the symptoms of going light. But when we talk about going like young finches, particularly green finches, we're talking about a specific disease that is ato atoxoplasmosis. Um, is, is what affects them. So you definitely that would be a must medication to have with the most species of finches that you're breeding. You'd have to have one of them, yeah. Yep. The other ones I would have, I'd have doxycycline for sure, because ornithosis is a huge problem. Um, you know, it's it's a lot more common than I think what people recognize it as the late the, the late paul harrison a guy from down in cumbria that a lot of bird guys will know him as well paul unfortunately passed away but paul was a fantastic bird breeder and paul one year spent a thousand pound on vets fees because he had a problem with his birds and they couldn't find out what it was and um, he kept norwich canaries and he bred a lot of mules in the hybrids bred some fantastic natives as well and he was getting a lot of issues with the birds not being well and we see young birds in a nest sticking their heads up to to be fed and they were dying in the nest and the symptom the young birds had was they were um, inside the beak when they when they opened the mouth, you could see this sort of bubbling, sort of almost like um, fluid coming out of the mouth, out of the beak, but yeah. bubbles, you know. In other words, they were struggling to breathe. The, the, the lungs were getting, they were basically, you know, um, they were drowning basically in their own, their own sort of saliva. So Paul spent a lot of money. Um, and the vets initially diagnosed it as coccidiosis. And the reason they probably did that is they would have tested the birds' droppings and found uses in them and so on. So you treated them for coccidiosis, it didn't really work. You went back again and over a period of time, they diagnosed it was ornithosis. Now ornithosis is this, this disease the birds get. And I've described what it looks like in chicks in the nest, but in older birds, adult birds, you often see the, the, the you see it in the eyes actually, the eyes will be watery and streaming and you'll hear the birds sneezing or coughing. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a really, it's a, really bad respiratory disease yeah and lots of birds carry it and you never know they've got it actually and um, but once they've got it and once you've got one or two birds um dying with it or whatever then you know you've got a problem all the other birds will be carrying carrying it so the drug of choice for that one's doxy doxycycline so and um, it's such a common disease that that i think you'd have to have some doxycycline available 
So, um, just just on doxycycline, um, I've not looked into that an awful lot. What would be something that contains that? Um, um, of, is it Thailand? No, it's, no, Thailand's a Thailand. Thailand's sorry, a different that's thing. different. Yeah, um, <coughs> yeah do, doxycycline. I, um, I, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know what the current brand names of it are. Actually, all you need to do is just well, I will tell you a story about doxycycline, right? A number of years ago, when I started using it for the birds, I was getting the, the birds were really well. My, my father at this point in time was still keeping his pigeons, yeah, and he wasn't having put it, he wasn't having an awful lot of success. And I was over at his house one day, and I said to him, he used to get like a typical pigeon man, he'd buy all this stuff from the seed merchants and all that, and I'd go through to see him on a Sunday with the kids, and he opened the covers and he'd pull all this stuff out. What do you think of this? What do you think of that? And so he'd throw that in the bucket, throw that in the bucket and stuff. Anyway, one day I said to him. I wonder if you should try treating the birds for ornithosis. Yeah, he said, what's ornithosis? And I explained it to him. He said, yeah, it might be an idea. I said, oh, okay. So we sent away, it was, I think it was Ronfried, actually, a German company, Ronfried. We've got some brilliant products, yeah. I sent away from him. We got a tub of doxycycline sent back. And I worked out what the dose was. And we treated these pigeons, you know, for, we actually just did a 14-day course for all the birds. My God, what a, what a, what a, what a, what a race and season he had after that. And I said to him, like, let's treat the birds for for fourteen days for it, and then after it, treat treat the birds the, the birds that you're going to race at the weekend, put them on doxy for a couple of days before you send them away in the basket, because other birds in the basket that are mixing up, when um, other other people's birds will have the disease. Yeah. Anyway, because I, I I thought myself, if you think about a pigeon or a bird that's flying a long distance at speed, if it can't breathe properly, it's in trouble. It's not going to perform. So anyway, we, we started using doxycycline, and my God. I think it was one season, I don't know how many young bird races, 12 young bird races, they won 10 of them, something like that. It was dramatic, the change, because it suddenly cleared up his bird's lungs and they could breathe better and the performance of the birds was fantastic. So doxycycline's are, it's a great. There was another actually drug, another, a, a drug that preceded. Um, doxycycline it belongs to a bunch of antibiotics called the tetracyclines. So the, 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 you know, doxycycline is a tetracycline. Tetracycline itself, a tetracycline hydrochloride, was the first one of these that was ever discovered. And was often, years ago, used, men used that as well. And then there was another one after that came called chlortetracycline. A lot of the older guys will remember this one. Its brand name is oreomycin. And it was like a kind of turquoise colour powder. And you put it in the water and shook it up and gave the birds that. There was a guy I used to knock about with years ago, near where I lived, through in Edinburgh. A guy called Ronald Lane. And Ronald was a great bird man. And at the time, it never struck me what he was doing at the time, but I remember he always used to have a tub of this blue powder. And what he would do is, he used to have his, his sort of aviaries and he'd have his cage, you know, his shed with all his cages, with flight cages underneath. Sometimes I'd go up at night after work and would sit and drink coffee in, in his shed for hours at, talking with birds. And Ronald, <laughs> Ronald would take the little clip-on drinkers, he'd turn them upside down, clean them out, turn them up with water, and he'd dip a knife, you know, a sharp knife, into the in, into the oreomycin and just put some oreomycin, a very small amount, and in, into the drinkers and clip it back on again. And I used to do that regularly. Most times I went up, there'd be that blue tinge on it on his drinkers. Now that, I used to say, why are you do that? It's good for the birds. It keeps them healthy. I didn't realise until years after what he was doing. He was effectively suppressing. He didn't know either. He was suppressing ornithosis in his birds by constantly dosing them with a small dose of of, of chlortetracycline. That's what he was doing. Oh, now, nice. obviously, doxycycline came after that. Doxycycline is much more effective um, than the, than tetracycline or chlortetracycline. It does the job. But ornithosis is, is a huge problem with birds, and that would be one that I'd have as well. Fantastic. But I'd only use it if the birds had the symptoms. If they had watery eyes or seen some sneezing or birds off colour, I'd, I'd use it then. Right, OK. And um, just on, on that with um, the ornithosis and, and what... Would you say that the symptoms are sort of very similar to uh, air sac mite and birds gaping? How would you maybe tell yeah. the difference between that? I know that Dave Cochran actually in, in, in the, the forum had posed that question, didn't he? With the various yes. different respiratory diseases, how do we, how do you diagnose them? The other answer is it's extremely difficult to separate them, yeah. to diagnose them, because the symptoms are quite similar. So if you think about you know, respiratory infections that birds get, you've got ornithosis, which we've spoken about, You've got canker as well. Yeah, yeah. a lot prominent um, in pigeons, I think, kids, and it canker. Yeah, more common in pigeons, but birds get it as well. So what yeah. you see with ornithosis is there's sort of wetness about the eyes, you know. Um, 
often cough and sneezing with with canker um trichomoniasis to give it its correct name it's another protozoal disease you're not a bacterial disease protozoa so so canker is 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 um you get these sort of deposits in the throat and in the mouth it's easy to see in pigeons because you can open their beaks and have a look inside and it's like cheese it's like a cheesy deposit inside the inside the cheeks and stuff yeah um so you know you know that's what it is and therefore you can treat that it's harder to see it and recognize it in small birds but what you see in small birds with canker is you often see it in their eyes again so that the eyes will be wet and streaming and and the feathers down lower down from below the eyes will often be sticky and matted with a clear liquid that's just their eyes streaming because the right you know the eye canals their nose the nasal passages are all blocked up with the, with the, with the disease um, the, the drug you'd use for that would normally be a drug called ronidazole, which a pigeon men have been using it for years for canker as well. Years ago, when I was in my teens, I hand read a tawny owl when you, yeah. you know, hand, hand read it from a chick, and it, it turned ill. And it turned ill, I didn't know at the time until years after, until I started to understand what had gone on. But my father was keeping pig pigeons, and I had the owl in a shed in the garden. And then um, he was giving me the old chicks and knocking them on the head, and I was feeding them to the owl. That was you know, one of the things I fed yeah. in this diet, as well as mice and stuff. And because the kid, the pigeons were probably carrying canker, it passed on to the owl. And how in hawks and owls, it's called frowns. Frowns, it's called same disease. It's instead of being called canker, it's called frowns, and the treatment's the same. But I took the bird into Edinburgh Zoo, and the vet in there had a look at it, and he says, "Yeah, I, I know that. I, know, I can treat that." So I, I just donated the bird, and they kept it and treated the bird. But hawks and owls got it as well. So you've got you've got canker there as well. You've also got a condition called mycoplasmosis. Mycoplasmosis again, it's just a respiratory disease. The symptoms are more like laboured breathing, not so much wetness about the eyes. You don't really see that in, in mycoplasmosis, but very heavy laboured breathing. And it's very difficult to diagnose because, you know, it's not easy to tell, tell it apart. For mycoplasmosis, that's when you use your Tylosin, your Tylan. Yeah. Tylosin's a drug, Tylan's a brand. And you probably use it in a dose of 500 milligrams per litre and put them on that for seven or 10 days. You'd use that. Another thing that causes breathing problems, and a lot of people don't realise this, it's just simply the bird's too fat. So if you think about humans, yeah, you and I, you, we've, we've got a diaphragm across yep. almost like just under your breastplate. It's a hard muscular tissue called the diaphragm. Now what the diaphragm does is your guts, your intestines and stomach are below the diaphragm and your heart and your lungs are above the diaphragm. Yeah, the diaphragm separates these two parts of your body cavity. Birds don't have a diaphragm. What birds, what birds have that are different from us is they have air sacs. So they've got a pair of lungs like we do, but they've also got nine air sacs and they, they, they inflate as well. So when the bird's breathing out, the air sac can fill the lungs back up. So it's possible for a bird to virtually keep its lungs inflated all the time by using the air sacs. But the thing is, if you think about it, if a bird's really fat and its, and its t intestines are swollen and its liver's swollen because it's overfed and it's too fat, those, those intestines and, and stomach will be pushed up against the lungs. And that alone can make a bird gasp and breathe. It's just too fat, it's too heavy. You often see big birds, big fat over overweight birds sitting panting. They're not they don't have a yeah. disease, they're just they're just physically out of shape. So it's just like and exerting pressure on the air sacs and Exactly, yeah, yeah. The, the guts are pushed on the air sacs and making the bird breathe heavily and, and labour breathing. So so that's another one. And another thing you've got is air sac mates. So again, air sac mates can cause a lot of problems as well with birds breathing. Um Again, very, very hard to diagnose. They are so small, they're microscopic. You can't even see the damn things, you know? Yeah. Um, and again, your treatment for them would be sort of moxidectin or even, even um, what's the drug we used to dip, dip, dip in the back of the head, actually? Um, ivermectin. Yes. You know, would, yeah, would be no, for air sac yeah. mites. But I, I think air sac mites are... I see a lot of stuff in the forums with air sac mites. I don't think air sac mites are anywhere near as common or prevalent as people think it is it's actually quite a rare disease um so so actually what we think is air sac mite is rather something else um, well but it's possible birds can have ears they can have air sac mite yeah. that's possible yeah i'll tell you the best way you find it but if your birds have got air sac mite it's maybe a drastic way to do it but if you killed a bird or killed one of them and kept it away from other birds and left it when its body gets cold the air sac mite will crawl out of it they'll come out and you'll see them as tiny tiny white spots round about the bird's face and neck. If you see that, they've got air, they've had air, that bird's had air sac mate. But the only way you can do that is to kill the bird, because they'll come out once you yeah. kill the bird. As its body cools down, they'll move. Wow. That, Other than that, yeah, very, that very, diff very, very difficult to diagnose it. Yeah. 
Now, I'm going to say, it's not, I presume you couldn't really even do that under a microscope because you'd actually have to get it out of the air sac, wouldn't you? Well, you uh, would, exactly. How, how on earth are you going to get it out yeah. of the air sac? You know, unless the bird's got a really bad dose of it and it's coughing and sneezing all the time, then if you maybe get some fluid at the back of its throat, maybe you can diagnose it then, but it's not easy to diagnose it. It's quite tricky. Wow. Um, as you mentioned about uh, Dave Coughlin, um asking about that, so we're on about respiratory infections, gapes, air sac, my, um, we spoke about actually the differences. Um, I don't know, what, what, what would you recommend then? Is, is there one thing that might treat overall better or I, I don't know um, yeah. you know do, doxycycline for example uh, doxycycline uh, family of meds you'd mentioned um, uh, uh, just different things like that what what would you recommend see what what they do in the continent yeah, often is um, a lot of these manufacturers in the continent they go for a scattergun approach so what you'll get is you'll get this product that says for the spirit of diseases and when you look in the back of the packet there's four different drugs in it right so they're, yeah. they're throwing everything out. <laughs> they're chucking everything in there. There might be doxycycline, two or three other different drugs, all for different, you know, there might be tylosin in it as well. So you'll get three or four different drugs all on that one product. And they know because it's so difficult to diagnose, they're just going to throw everything at it and hopefully catch one of them, whatever whatever it is, it is the bud's got. It's in that product. So you're going to, you're going to treat it if that makes sense. Whereas over yeah. here, you tend to find that less often. It's just because of the drug regulations and stuff over here. I think the rules are quite tight with, with, with drug administration, um, but it's a very it's a difficult one. You know, it, you almost need to do it by, you know, a process of elimination. Yeah. You know, if the bird's got watery eyes, chances are it's either ornithosis, um, or it, or it might have canker. More than likely ornithosis, right? Yeah? So you know what drugs that we, we know what drugs we can use for them for both of these conditions. I'd yeah. start with ornithosis first. And if that didn't cure it up, and maybe, and maybe then start thinking about giving a canker treatment. What I should say, though, the problem with ornithosis, though, the tetracycline antibiotics to cure on the, well, I shouldn't say cure ornithosis, because all these conditions I'm talking about, just about every single one of them, are not curable. None of these drugs cure the disease. They just put it in remission and get it under control. That's all they do. Yeah. But with ornithosis, if, you're, if you know that a bird's got ornithosis, you're sure it's got it. Let's say you've had a, a bird post-mortem, the vet say that's what they've got. You should be using the drug for 30 days. 30 days continuously, right? Now, most guys wouldn't do that. They'd use an antibiotic for seven days and take them off it. They see an improvement after seven days. They're like, oh, that's great. I've cured the bird. They take it off it a month later, the bird's just as bad again because they haven't used the drug for long enough. Now, on a, like I say, the tetracyclines for ornithosis are, are different from most other drugs because you have to, it's a 30 day treatment you need to use. Whereas if you treat them for canker, it's a couple of days at most type thing. You know, when most other drugs, yeah. He was, you wouldn't use it for that length of time. That's why when I go back to Ronald, when he was using the clotetracycline, you know, the oreomycin, and his drinkers, he was actually giving them it all the time, constantly. And that's why they never seem to get that disease. His buds are always quite fit and healthy. Having said that, I'm pretty sure that he's, you know, the disease would um, would become resistant eventually to what he was, what he was doing. But yeah. He didn't know what he was doing, and I didn't know either. It's just that years later, I realised, I began to realise what it was he was doing. No, that's... So, um... Yeah, yeah, you're dead right though. Um, obviously, they could build the resistance up by constantly dosing it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, respiratory well, diseases are a big problem in birds, in small birds. They really are. And it's, I mean, I can't give you. A, there's no silver bullet actually, no magic bullet for it. I just, it's so difficult to diagnose them. That's the problem, you know. Yeah, it's. Um, it seems to be more. Um, yeah, I think a bird that's commonly suffers from it is bullfinches. Um, yeah. Any idea why? <laughs> well, years and years ago, I, I kept bullfinches and, and I was breeding them actually. And around two years in a row, around Christmas time, I lost all the young birds. You know, they just went yeah. down, bang, bang, bang. Early December, it happened. Two years in a row, I couldn't understand it. Anyway, the second year it happened, I took three of them and got them post mortem. There's a, a place in Edinburgh called the, the Bush Estate. It's like a big veterinary. Um, it's where all the vets, if you, if you go to a vet, and you give them, the, the vet's got a dead bird or he's got a sample and he wants to get post-mortem, that's where they send it to, they send it to the bush. But I went straight to directly myself and I took the birds to them and they post-mortem them. Now what came back, the diagnosis, was I isosporosis. Isospora, isospora are just a form of coccidiosis. I mean, coccidiosis, there's two forms. There's isospora, which affect the small birds that we keep, and there's the, the media that affect the game birds, the bigger birds actually. 
and it came back. The diagnosis is isosporosis. That's what they had. The coccidiosis. So then I, you know, I used a sulfur drug and I helped them. But again, coming back to bullfinches with the the respiratory issue, I don't know why they're so vulnerable. I think I'm, I think I'm right in saying that bullfinches, when they're feeding youngsters, they can they can form pouches. They can store food outside their crop in pouches. Yeah. I think, yeah. And I, I've often so I wonder whether because of that they're liable to get infection in those pouches, or is there something about the structure of their um, air sacs that makes them more vulnerable? I, I don't really know. Um, but you know, if I was keeping bullfinches out again, I would. I'd be I'd be using baycocks on them two or three times once a quarter every three months I'd dose them with baycocks <laughs> particularly young birds as it comes up to the sort of after the autumn time I, I treat them in um, yeah you know, but, but it's a difficult one I, I don't there's no I can't give you a, a definite answer as to why bullfinches are most more susceptible but they are I'm I'm just on that I'm I'm, just, I'm most wondering maybe it's a larger surface area. In the air sacs, perhaps maybe, yeah, maybe. something like that. More yeah. surfaces for them to live on, but yeah, uh, it could it could be. Um, wow. <laughs> so, do you agree with um, the? I'm gonna have to try, try and pronounce this right. The prophylactic use of medication and what would the effects of the bird um, the effect be on the bird's own immune system? So, prophylactic medication is um, preventative. Yeah, if you think about drugs, there's, there's two or three different ways to describe how you would use drugs. There's what you call a therapeutic dose. <coughs> so a therapeutic dose would be the dose required to have an effect on the disease or whatever you're going to treat. So if you if you had a sore head, and you were going to use paracetamol, then the the, the therapeutic dose of paracetamol for an adult human would be 500 milligrams to 1,000 milligrams. And they come in 500 milligram tablets. So you take one or two tablets four times a day. That would be your therapeutic dose that would have the effect. Yeah. So that's one dose. You can then have a sub-therapeutic dose, which is really, again, your prophylactic bit comes in, yeah? So prophylactic, well, with prophylactics, there's two ways of doing it. You can either use a, you can use a therapeutic dose, a correct dose, but you use it prophylactically. In other words, the birds have got no sign of disease whatsoever, and you give them a dose of a drug to stop something. Or you can give, give them a sub-therapeutic dose. So if I give, give you two examples, if you're gonna use, a lot of guys use Baycox and use it every month, once a month, for two days. And what that does is it keeps the coxie under control. It brings it, you know, it stops use, it brings the numbers right down and therefore helps the birds. And there's lots of breeders on the continent We do that for very many years, the goldfinches. Guys buy the goldfinches, bring them over, over here, don't realize they're doing that. Don't feed them the drugs and before they know it, bang, you know, the birds have got a super infection with coxidiosis and kills them. So you can use a therapeutic dose as a prophylactic, if you like, as a preventative and use it on a regular basis. Or you can do what Ronald was doing, again, going back to his oreomycin example, where he was using a sub-therapeutic dose, it was a tiny, tiny amount he was putting on the end of a knife and sticking it in a drinker. Now, if the bird had the infection, had a full-blown infection, ornithosis, that wouldn't have stopped it because the dose is too low. But he was using a sub-therapeutic dose every single day, virtually, and that was keeping it in check. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's all a prophylactic dose is. Is it a good thing? Well, if you think about over the years, guys breeding green finches, they've all given them either sulfonamide antibiotics over the summer or they give them baycocks and they, they use it prophylactically because you know with that disease, if the, bird, if the young bird catches the disease, it's too late. If you see the symptoms, the bird's gone. It'll, nine times out of ten, they'll die because the parasite, the um, atoxoplasmosis parasite, it damages the line in the gut, it destroys it actually. And there's no recovery from that. Once you show the symptoms, it's too late to put the drugs on, they're gone. So you have to use the drug in that case prophylactically. So like I said to you earlier on, when I, I used to use the sulfonamides, I put the, put the young birds on it for, on the day they came at the nest. And the reason I did that is when they came at the nest, first three or four or five days or so, the adult birds will still be feeding them. But once the young birds start to pick a bit for themselves, they're picking seeds all, all, all over the, the every surface. And they're picking seeds up where the adult birds have been as well. And adult birds, although they're perfectly okay and healthy, they're carrying that disease, that atox atoxoplasmosis, and they're passing the oocysts in their own droppings. And the young birds come along and pick it up, and that's how the young birds get infected. So you protect the young birds by using a prophylactic dose. You give them the drug before they get the disease. It's the only way to stop it in them. So prophylactic administration of drugs is a brilliant idea, and it and it's really good to do. But you just you don't, but you want to do it in a measured, sensible way. 
where you know it's going to work and not just recklessly bang antibiotics into your buds all the time when they've got no disease. Yeah, th that, uh, yeah that, that really answers it. Thank you very much. Um, so we've got a bit of a, another question which come in. So uh, a, recently a friend had uh, three young red poles. He plucked them um, and put them on colour feed. Uh, two, two weeks on the colour feed, he had some aviform to the uh, red water. Um, and then w when he got back after a few hours, two of the birds were uh, unwell and, and one were dead. Uh, so do you think there's anything that, you know, it, would you not mix something with carafil if you're... Uh, colour feeding a bird is there any yeah would you would you recommend even mixing medications or just leaving it as the straight medication and supplementing it at different times it's always best to leave medication straight because they can interact with each of them and and fundamentally change the the, the structure of the, the antibiotics so if, you know go, go back to doc, doxycycline when you're using doxycycline you don't want to use tap water you want to use distilled water because the metallic ions, the, the, the minerals, the tap water will bind to the doxycycline and it activates it, make it, it just won't, won't work after that, right? So it's always best to keep drugs separately as much as you can, yeah? yeah. Coming back to your example though, with the Carafel Red and the, um, was it a form did you say? Was it uh, yes, yeah. There's one or two things probably happened there. I very much doubt if mixing the aviform with the Carafel it's created a toxic substance that's killed the birds. It's highly unlikely. Yeah. Yeah. Either those red poles were sensitive, and the bodies for some reason couldn't take the aviform or whatever was in it. And I mean, I think aviform has got a, a fairly strong antiseptic product in it. So they were either that was that was right for them, and it was they couldn't take it, or the taste of the water has stopped them from drinking, and they've died through dehydration. Yeah. So small birds, red poles, lesser red poles, more than any other bird will die very quickly if they don't drink. They have to drink all the time. Um, and if they don't, for whatever reason, if you put stuff in their drinker that tastes horrible or smells horrible and they shine away from it, they, they become dehydrated and they'll just, they'll just pop, pop their clog quickly. I'll tell you a story. Year, years and years ago, I used to go, uh, I was friendly. Jim Rankin and I were both friendly with the Hintocks, Ken and John Hintock from um, down in Lymouth near Newcastle. And they had very good green finches, but really good mealy red poles, really good lesser red poles. And there was one particular year that Ken had a lesser red pole cock. It was one in everywhere. I think it had won the Yorkshire Old British, had won the Scottish National, and all sorts of things. It's a great bird. Anyway, at the end of January, he took it down to Winsford to the Old British and showed it there. And the bird didn't win. I don't think, I can't remember if it didn't win its class, but it didn't do very well. It's a two day show, see? Yeah. So I used to walk, I'd, I'd always in the hall walk around, look at all the birds and so on. And on the second day, the second day in particular was a really sunny day and the sun was coming in through the windows and the position that bird's cage was in and the, the stage it was in, the sun was beating right on all these cages all day long actually. And that bird was up on the top shelf and the sun was beating in its cage all day long. And I, I walked back and forth and knew the bird wasn't right. It looked a little bit soft, you know? Yeah. And I was standing against the wall at one point in time for about an hour talking to a guy. And I, I kept watching about it. It didn't want, not once they go to the drink and take a drink. And I thought that's that's not good, like you know. So I walked over and lifted it off the bench and put it on the bottom, the bottom bench, to try and put it in a bit of shade, take the heat, the the, the blaze, the sun off it. Yeah. Anyway, when it came at the end of the show, we boxed all the birds up, and I was taking Ken and John back and dropping them off at their house. And we we're talking about the bird going up in the car, and I said, Ken, you need to make that bird if it's still alive when we get back to your place. You'll need to make it drink, or it'll, it'll never survive the night. So we got back up and he put it. In, he opened the cage and put it in his little flight cage, and the bird was sitting there all hunched up. And I said to Ken, "Lift it up and make it drink." So he lifted it up and dipped its beak in the water, and it started to drink. And he let it go, and it stood, stood on the edge of the drinker. I've never seen a bird drink so much in my life. It just drunk a huge amount of water, kept throwing its head back, drinking. And it was perfectly okay the following day. But if that bird hadn't drunk that night, it was going to be dead in the morning. So I think your, your guys' red poles were putting the stuff in the water, maybe. It's maybe just been the taste of the water that's put them off it. Yeah. Unless unless the carafel in the, in the water was the first thing they'd put it in. If that, if that was the first thing they'd seen carafel red, it might have just frightened them or put them off drinking it. I don't know. Um, I mean, one thing you always want to do with young, with young birds is for that very reason, at the risk of dehydration, is when you're showcase training them, I, what I used to always do was take a young bird, say a young red pole or whatever, stick it in a showcase, put it up in the bench that I had inside the shed, but I'd often put a, put, I'd always put a drinker on it, on the cage, but I'd also 
put an adult bird in a cage and try and turn the two cages so the two cages were sure were facing each other. Because adult yeah. bird will go down and drink all the time, and the young bird will see and learn to do it as well fairly quickly. Either that, or put a fountain drinker on the cage one, and put a drinker, a day drinker, a day cup, on the wire to make yeah. sure the bird finds where to drink from. You've got to do that, you know, young birds. Uh, that that uh, that's great. That that makes a lot of sense. So um, it, it's unlikely to be a reaction. Um, it, yeah, so it's it's unlikely to be a reaction in the carafil and the um, aviform. It's, it's uh, highly it's, it's highly unlikely. Yeah, yeah uh, but yeah. more just dehydration uh, based on that foul yeah. taste, foul smell, etc. Um, is there anything, uh, any medication we could use to treat fatty liver disease in the birds? Fatty liver disease. Um... Fatty liver diseases is actually, well, years and years ago, there was a, when I first started getting into medications, there was a company, a French company called the um, Vig, Lab, Vig Laboratories. They, they, they made this little pamphlet and they used, they used to sell a lot of products. Yeah, But the yeah. very, very first product I ever saw anybody using for going like young greenfinches was made by them. And it was a product called Osicoxo. And, and I got some of that as well, and it was the very first drug I ever used to stop the green finches going light. But they also produced a product called Osicoline, and there is a there's a nutrient. It's not an amino. It's like an amino acid, but it's not. It's, it's choline. C H O L I N E. So they produce this stuff called Osicoxo, and they recommended it was used for fatty liver. Now, fatty liver though is quite a rare thing in birds. It's caused by a deficiency of choline. So if they aren't getting choline in their diet, they'll create a fatty liver. And that's a completely different thing from birds being overweight and fat. Yeah. It's, it's, there's no connection whatsoever with a bird being overweight and fat and giving it choline, it'll have no effect. But if a bird's got a fatty liver because its diet is deficient in choline, then giving it choline will certainly help it. Yeah. And again, you go back to your vitamin products and stuff like that, you'll often see that as an ingredient an ingredient in, in multivitamin powders or solutions or whatever, choline's often in it. Um, right, okay. You know, and you, choline, you know, you can get choline, you can find it as, as quite, eggs are quite rich in it as well. So if you're using egg in your egg food, that'll have choline in it. And vegetables as well. So if you're giving vegetables, grated carrot or broccoli or stuff like that, that'll also have choline in it as well. Right, okay. That That's great. Um, yeah, it makes complete sense. Um, so one of the final questions we come to, we kind of answered this earlier. It was on about changing medication maybe annually to prevent resistance and, and stuff is there is that maybe yeah would you just li uh, live by that just try and change up your medication occasionally so you don't get the resistance and maybe has more of an effect on the birds most of the stuff i've spoken about with with the exception of um with, with the exception of, of bacops which you use on a regular basis we know there's a specific reason why we need to do that you know, you like to think that most guys aren't going along and, and banging sort of, you give them a buzz, you know, doxycycline and all these different things, treatment for cancer, all these different things, banging into them all the time. You'd be, you'd be mad if you did that, actually. You'd just hurt the birds. There's no point yeah. in doing that. You should only give them a, a, a drug if you're fairly sure they've got a disease and you're trying to treat someone, right? With exception of the prophylactics like Bacox or sulfur drugs for going light, actually. So, um, Sorry, I've lost the thread of your question again. What was the question? Yeah, it's all right. Um, so, uh, actually, just just changing medication to uh, to prevent uh, resistance. Yeah, it's always a good idea to change medication. But the thing is, like, you know, a lot of the a lot of these drugs that I've spoken about are specific for specific diseases. So, e even with the different types of protozoal disease, yeah you'll find there's a specific drug will treat each individual protozoal disease, not one that covers a whole lot. So with that in mind, it's quite difficult. I mean, if you look, if, again, going back to the going light and the atoxoplasmosis that young birds get, you know, we're using Bacox now, we're using sulfonamide antibiotics before that, the sulfur drugs. Trouble is the sulfur drugs, a lot of them have been discontinued now and they're getting harder to get. So there's a limitation of what's available as well in terms of drugs. And we're having for all these different conditions, ornithosis, the drug of choice is doxycycline. If you weren't going to use doxycycline, you'd use another tetracycline. Because I can't think of another, another group of antibiotics other than, other than the tetracyclines that would do for that disease. Do you see what I mean? So in theory, yeah. it's good to circulate and use different ones. But the reality is, you're often limited by the number of the, the ones that are available or the, the, the range of them available. 
to do specific diseases, and they're all quite specific for specific diseases. I mean, one question I, I wish I had a five every time I asked, I was asked this one. You know, what's the best broad spectrum antibiotic? If there was one antibiotic you'd like to keep, Dave, or you would use, what would it be? I can't. I, I wouldn't give you an answer to that question because there's no such thing. I know that you'll you'll read stuff in books and whatnot about broad spectrum antibiotics. But from what I've described, the, the things that treat protozoa, the, the, you know, the drug ronitazole that treats um, canker, it's only effective against canker. It's not broad spectrum, you know. Yeah. Somebody in the forum mentioned Batril. Ba Batril is a is an antibiotic. Yeah? It's a completely different drug from Baycox. Completely different drug. It would have no effect whatsoever on um, atoxoplasmosis, yeah. Where Batril comes in is... Basal is good in some respects that a lot of antibiotics is are taken orally, they're absorbed really quickly, yeah, yeah, or they're broken down by the body quickly. Basal is different in that um, the name of the drug is enrofloxacin. Enrofloxacin is not broken down very easily and it passes through the body quite well. So you end what actually happens with that drug is when you take it orally, it goes right down through your stomach and into your intestines and actually reaches your bowel. There's lots of antibiotics if you take them orally and never get near your bowel. They're either absorbed or the body breaks them down before they get anywhere near the, the bowel. But Beto's different, Enrofloxus is different. It gets to the bowel, so it can be used for diarrhea and stuff like that. You know? oh, so yeah. I think what I'm trying to say to you is there is no such thing as a broad spectrum antibiotic. I don't care what people write about it, there's not. But in buds are specific drugs that you want to use for specific conditions, and there's not, there's not a magic bullet. Right. Wow. Um, no, I, th that's that's some great advice to uh, for, for people to pick up on on that. Um, thank you very much for sharing that. So, it, we're really at the end of the question. So, is there anything else you'd like to mention? Anything else you'd like to talk about? And um, obviously, uh, let us in on. Um, I think on a completely different subject, nothing to do with antibiotics or drugs or, or anything yeah. like that. <laughs> there was something, I saw someone on the forum recently, about a week or so ago, and it made me think about something that Jack Lloyd said to me, not that long, two or, well, maybe a couple of months ago. I was talking to Jack on the phone one night, and Jack's an amazing guy, everybody knows he is. Jack will come out with stuff and you think, where did they get that from? I was talking to Jack one night, and he just happened to come out with this thing that, um, in his belief, that to fill a clutch of eggs. If a hen lays five eggs, it'll need to be treaded five times. One tread per full egg. Now, I'd never thought about that before. No, no one crossed my mind, right? Because I used to always think, like, you see an Avery's buds treading, the cock will be treading the hen on a regular basis, and so on and so forth. But why do you why do you get clear eggs and stuff like that? You know, what, what actually causes that? And Jack, and Jack said to me, um, it's been his belief for a number of years, and, and it relate, relates back to something I used to do, but I had the green finches, and Jim Rankin has done it all, all, all the years I've known Jim. Terry McCracken does it, Jack does it. The method of breeding, breeding green finches is you control the cock bud. So you maybe end up with, I don't know, if you have 12 aviaries and 12 hens, one in each aviary, and you've picked the cock bud you want to go to each hen, you don't pair them up as such and keep them together in the lead up to the breeding season. You keep them separate. Or you might have the cock in then, as the hens start to get fit, you'll take the cock away. Yeah. yeah, and then when the hen looks like she's getting ready, she starts building a nest. Then you put the cock in, and he tread her. And once he treads her, you lift them, take her back out, and take him back out, and put him in a cage in the shed. Then the following day, you drop him back in again, and he treads the hen, and you take him back out again and put him back in the shed. And the reason, the reason, the, the, the real reason for doing that is it allows you to use that cock with multiple different hens, which is with green finches you can do that, as you know. Yeah. Lots of other finches you can't. They kill each other, you know and bullfinches and so on they pair up quite the pair bond quite tightly so the idea is you know keep taking the cock away again put the hen and so on and so forth and then jack said to me like i say fairly recently it's his belief that for each each egg to get fertilized the cock needs to tread the hen the day before the hen lays the eggs yeah. each each individual egg if that makes sense yeah which makes a lot of sense that it relates back to i think i said to you at the start here I had a couple of bad breeding seasons. The two breeding seasons I had before I gave the birds up, I had two bad, bad breeding seasons. And one of the reasons I think about it now, what Jack said is, I was away travelling a lot of the time, yeah? And I might, on a Monday morning or whatever, run the cocks with the hens and I'd take them back out again. And I'd be away up north or whatever for three or four days staying in a hotel, wouldn't we get, get back to Friday? And I'm wondering why I'm getting clear eggs. But that was probably the reason why. And another thing I thought about is when you think about it, seabirds. Why do big seabirds only lay one egg? You know, so fulmers yeah. want to lay one egg, gannets lay one egg, um, razor balls, corn, you know, um, 
guillemots, all these birds lay one single egg. And I, and I reckon the reason they do that, or probably through evolution, one of the things that's caused it, is when these big seabirds go to feed, they, they fly for if miles, if not hundreds of miles out to sea, to feed. Yeah. Now, if a razor ball hem is laying five different eggs, is that cockbird going to be back and forth all the time to tread her? Highly unlikely. If it's one egg and he, and he treads her with one egg, it'll be full. And then he's away for two or three days feeding, then coming back. Maybe that's the evolution, right? Why they just lay one single egg. Yeah. But it's an interesting it's an interesting concept that a cock has to fill each individual egg with individual treads rather than just one tread full of a clutch of five. Yeah, that that that's an interesting thought. Um obviously Jack has got a lot of experience. Um You need to get Jack on here actually. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um I'd love to. Uh, I think we're gonna work on that and hopefully we'll be able to at some point. Um I know that hens can store the sperm of a cockbird. I think it, I think in finches and stuff, it can be up to like twenty one days. Um, but the idea makes sense that if there's not enough to put uh, across a, a whole batch of eggs, uh, a clutch of eggs from one single tread, then um, a- absolutely. And I guess it, it having them tread more would actually increase your chances of those full eggs. Yeah. So. It's worth thinking about, yeah, actually. You know, just definitely. um, you know, and one other thing I was I was going to add in as well, actually, and, and this would be about again, we'll lead up to the breeding season now, and there's a lot of stuff in the forums about, you know, getting the birds ready for breeding, so on and so forth. I've always believed that it's really important in the lead up to the breeding season you stimulate the birds by food. So the change in light as the days get longer and so on, that has a big effect on bringing birds into breeding condition. But the food they get access to has got a big impact as well, a big impact. So, you know, most of, the, most of the guys now, since January or whatever, they're starting to be egg food in, starting to be soak seed in, so on and so forth. Um, and that's absolutely, it's really important. And I remember, again, I'll tell you a story about a number of years ago, one of the shows, Don, a guy called Don Footit, brilliant bird man, brilliant bird man. Um, doesn't keep birds anymore, but he keeps pigeons, he's in racing pigeons, has been for a number of years. But I remember at a show one time talking to, to, to um, Don about, well, it might have been on the phone, I can't remember. I remember having a discussion with him about how he was managing to breed so many crossbow hybrids. Because Dom was the first guy that pioneered that. He bred, you know, Goldie crossbows, Red Bull crossbows, crossbow mules. I mean, he was a man, he was knocking them out. Linnet Red crossbows, first man of it, but he breed them in Britain as well. So he got a lot of first breedings yeah. of crossbows, right? And I remember talking to him about his methods and, you know, what he was doing, how he used to manage these birds. And one thing he said to me was, he thought it was really important that crossbows had a food stimulation to, to trigger them into breeding. And what he used to do was, I think his brother Mike used to go to the continent quite a lot and buy crossbows in Austria or whatever and bring them back. And I think over there you can you could buy big bags of um, pine branches, but not branches, the tips, the very tip of, yeah. you, know, if, you know, I've got pine sort of um, trees outside, little ones and so on. And what I notice is when it comes to springtime and summer, and they start to um, they start to expand. You see the tips; it's a fresh growth, if you like, of the tree on the very, very tips of the branches. Well, I think over in, over in the continent, these guys latched onto that. The crossbows eat them. So what they were doing was snipping them all off or gathering them off the pine trees. These little tips, and then feeding the crossbows on them, and it acts as a stimulus because in the wild, that's that's what this, that's what brings them into breeding condition: eating those tips. Yeah, and it's just finding those little things in terms of what what is it the birds eat in the wild and each time of the year. And I know that like if you think of it now, everybody's desperate and waiting for the, the dandelions to come out because they're one of the finest things you can give a bird to bring in a breeding condition is dandelions and then chickweed as well. Yeah. But what are that? What are the birds outside the green finches, the gold finches? What 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 plants are they eating? January, February, March that will help bring them in a breeding condition. That's the thing to get your head around and think about. Go out and gather these things because they'll really help trigger the birds to breed yeah the the wild food um as a as a massive thing to bring them in condition like yeah that i'm, I'm going to show you this book I, I bought this book many years ago yeah i don't know if you see it yes got it's yeah. a book called finches by a guy called ian newton now i've still got the seat inside here and i bought this book in 1986 15 to february 1986 here's the receipt for it six pound fifty it was right now, this guy's an ornithologist, but he's also a scientist. He's done lots and lots of study, and this book is all about finches. And he takes each of the 18 European finch species in turn and talks about their breeding and all that sort of thing. But one of the things that he does for each finch, 
He's got a table that shows you. I don't know if you can see this actually on there. Yes, you've got. He's got a table that shows you for each time, each time of the year, what the birds eat in the wild. Yeah. yeah. So this 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 page here is open at um, greenfinches. So what it tells me is greenfinches from January through to March in the wild mostly eat Sherlock cultivated cereals. That'll be cereals that have, that's fallen off in, on the fields, obviously. Persicaria, um, burdock, and rose. R rose between January and February, actually. But four or five key parts of their diet January through to March. And then when it comes to March, they move on to chickweed, groundsel, dandelion, elm, dog's mercury, whatever dog's mercury is. I don't know what that is. I'll be a little bit goat's beard and less cultivated seeds. So that what they eat in the wild changes as the season moves. And I'm pretty sure that birds in the wild, there's, there are probably certain seeds that once they're available, once they, they start to get into these seeds, it just triggers them and makes them what makes them want to breed. Yeah. Yeah. And this guy in his book, he goes through every single finch and shows that there's, a, there's actually a table for every single one of them telling you what they eat in the wild. Now, I bought that book back in 1986. And I used to follow them religiously. I'd go out looking at I used to keep bullfinches and bullfinches and stuff. I'd go to the page in bullfinches. And I know, for example, on the bullfinch page, hawthorn is a massive part of the bullfinch's diet through the winter and right through spring. You know, mainly through spring, actually, once the buds come through. Hawthorn. Yeah. Uh, hawthorn. I used to go out and snip hawthorn branches and put them in aviaries, the bullfinches, the buds. I'm convinced this date but brought the buds into condition. So again, as we lead up to the breeding season and birds are starting to get fitter and stuff, it's something for the lads to think about is, Definitely. what is it you're doing to just create that, flick that switch in your birds and make them really want to breed? Yeah, so it's... A lot of it's to do with the diet. Nature. Yeah. <laughs> well, th they are some fantastic tips, mate. Is there anything else you'd like to point out and mention anything else about that? Um... No, I don't think so. Actually, I could talk all night, probably. As you probably, as you probably gathered, um, I'm just trying to think. Was there anything else that was asked for in the? I think we've answered pretty much the stuff that was on the the questions on the the forum, haven't we? Actually, yeah. That well, uh, that's fine. No problem, mate. Um, I'd, I'd scribbled them down actually. Um, yeah, that's pretty much about it. I think, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for coming on, mate. Good. You're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Hope the guys get something out of it. I'm sure they will. So that brings us to the end of episode four. So I do hope you've enjoyed it and found this useful and you've made plenty of notes on different things that you're going to use in your own bird room. I'd like to say a big thank you to Dave for coming on the show this week and, and, and sharing so much knowledge with us, which a lot of us, including myself, probably didn't have prior uh, to this call. So thank you very much, Dave. I'd also like to thank Avian World Dublin for sponsoring uh, Natives in Norwich group. And if you are new here and you haven't uh, joined the group and haven't watched any of the episodes, then there's a playlist for all of the different Natives in Norwich Zoom Room episodes and the link to the group will be in the description below. So if you have enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to the channel and that'll allow you to follow along with all of my different content. If you have enjoyed it, leave us a like and that'll show me that you have enjoyed it. You'd like to see more of the new Zoom Room. Um, get the notification bell on and you'll be notified every single time a new episode of the Zoom Room is released and any of my videos which I make on a weekly basis and then please do share this video with someone else who would find this useful. I'm sure many of us would find this useful so please do make sure you share it and get as many people to see this as possible so more people can understand how to give medication and different supplements and better the health of their birds. So thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.